is a very short introduction to the first of the challenging interactions uh, covered in the Managing in the Public Sector course. Um, so political, administrative and professional expertise, tensions between them, uh, similarities and differences. I will start with the third uh, of these professionals because often these are the first point of contact in a public service. This is why they are also referred to sometimes as street level bureaucrats because they are the closest to street level, the closest to service users. Um, so think uh, police officers, doctors, nurses, teachers, lecturers even. Um, social workers, housing officers, and so on. These professionals may be thought of as salaried employees, so um, belonging to an organization and being paid by an organization, but whose status have, um, has been legitimized by um, certain qualifications, um, the complexity encountered in their role, and the membership of exclusive professional bodies and professional associations. And these professional associations may, uh, in exchange for that membership, in encourage certain values, certain ethics, um, ethical standards on their members, as well as providing their members with um, particular uh, protocols and guidelines on how to do the otherwise very complex um, job that they do. I'll give you an example. Um, even though um, there are often no guidelines for some of the work that professionals um, deploy, um, there are some basic ones which help uh, the newer um, members of that profession to provide a similar or even identical service um, as somebody a lot more uh, experienced. So for example, um, the medical professional association in this country, and, and uh, these associations bear different names in different countries, um, the medical professional association issues um, protocols for uh, diagnosis um, by general practitioners. It doesn't mean that general practitioners don't know how to um, conduct a line of questioning um, of their patients to find out, for example, personal history um, of the condition that they're reporting and so on. Um, but these are helpful for the busy GP uh, who may be new in their job. And uh, um, it, it, it's also helpful for the service user um, because they can trust that they will receive the same um, type of service from a junior doctor as they would from a more senior doctor. And so, and uh, other professional associations issue similar protocols. So there is a protocol um, for, I don't know, approaching vulnerable children, um, a protocol for social workers. Um, there are protocols for um, uh, dealing with um, neurodiversity, for example, in higher education, so on and so forth. There are, there are a lot of um, practitioners' uh, toolkits uh, provided by these uh, professional bodies. So a, a useful way of thinking of professionals is that they live in between organizational boundaries and rules and routines and, um, uh, and their professional associations. Now, Weste is one of um, the known scholars on professionalism, but he is not the only one. Um, there are quite a few people who wrote on professionalism, particularly public sector professionalism. Um, I did too a couple of papers, so feel free to uh, refer to those as well. But Weste is as good a starting point as uh, any other, really. And uh, in his description of professionalism, he talks about, for example, a centrality of knowledge of tasks. What does this mean? It means that professionals are specialized. So social workers are not just social workers. They are um, children social workers or other social workers um, or other types of social workers. 
uh, doctors are not just doctors, they are um, specialized into various specialisms. Um, GP is a specialism in itself, uh, slightly more general than, say, um, heart surgeons. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a specialism nonetheless. Um, professional activity promotes social values in some way or another. Um, again, an example from medicine um, is that although we as service users may want to be prescribed antibiotics, um, societal values would go against that goal. Uh, because we as a society, uh, if we keep consuming antibiotics, can develop um, antibiotics resistance, and that affects all of us, not just the individual that happens to um, develop that problem. So therefore, GPs um, in many countries of the world, hopefully all countries of the world, um, now are very reluctant to prescribe antibiotics unless uh, it is for the um, harshest of, of situations, so say after surgery. Um, but gone are the days when you would get antibiotics um, because you had your, um, I don't know, uh, a, a, a small infection on your finger, right? So um, if uh, doctors were to serve individual patients, then they would prescribe antibiotics, no problem. Um, but because they promote social values, then they don't. Um, there are overall specific norms governing um, activities of all professionals, including public sector professionals, um, and those norms can refer, for example, to ethics, uh, as we spoke uh, about earlier. Finally, professionals tend to be located in some bureaucratic organizations. Now, there are two ways to interpret that in Western thinking. Um, did Western mean that professionals tend to be located in some organizations that um, may be organized uh, bureaucratically, uh, so not necessarily in the public sector, that's one interpretation, or Western may have meant that um, professionals tend to be located in public organizations. Well, both these uh, interpretations can be challenged because, for example, how about a doctor who has their own practice and does not employ anybody else? So they're not an employer and they don't have to have organizational boundaries for um, the various um, activities that they deploy. They can just deploy the activities that any doctor would privately, um, but um, be um, associated to NHS. So at the same time, being able to serve vulnerable individuals for free. Well, when they do that, um, they can't really be located in the public sector to start with because they run a public uh, service, public practice. Um, and, um, and because they don't employ anyone else, can't really talk about this as an organization, but rather a sole trader. So. Um, free professional, as they are called in some countries. Um, so that challenges a bit Wester's uh, assertion about professionals tending to be located in some bureaucratic organizations. Um, if we, however, take the word tend to be the meaning in most cases, but not necessarily, then I could agree with him more. Uh, indeed, most professionals uh, in the world work for the public sector, um, and the clue as to why this is uh, sits in that notion of social values. Even engineers, and most engineers don't work in the public sector or for public sector organizations and don't deliver public services, but even engineers, to the extent to which they promote social values such as safety, um, have um, some stewardship to the public, and this is why many of them deliver um, or contribute to uh, public services. Think, for example, um, nuclear engineers. Um, think uh, engineers that work in public utilities, uh, and there are 
large, large organizations that employ a good proportion of engineers. Uh, again, even though engineering is not necessarily a public sector professional, uh, a public sector profession. Um, professionals have institutional power, and that institutional power arises from an intellectual monopoly. So think, for example, how important a heart surgeon is to a hospital, right? And because they have that institutional power, they cannot really be managed in the same way in which, um, say, the hospital receptionist would be managed, because the hospital receptionist is easy to replace, whereas the heart surgeon is not. But power comes with responsibility. So professional ethics and professional accountability are very important um, notions in professionalism. Professionals are in the public sector, um, especially in the public sector, are both servants of the public and stewards of public resources. So they wish to promote social values and serve the public as a whole, not individuals, um, but also do so with um, uh, respect for the public purse. Is this an agency problem? In other words, uh, is there a conflict of interest? Potentially is the short um, answer to this. And we will discuss this in more detail uh, in the next video, next week, when we will focus on managing professionals. But when it comes to professional ethics, um, there are seven standards of ethics in public life. Um, they are also referred to as Nolan standards uh, or Nolan principles of public life. They apply to anyone who works in a public uh, office or as a public office holder. Um, so that includes professionals as well as civil servants, public servants and politicians. These uh, seven standards of public life are as follows. Selflessness, um, which stipulates that holders of public office should act solely in terms of the public interest. In other words, not their own interest, but the public interest. Remember the social values that we uh, referred to previously. Integrity, holders of public office must avoid placing themselves under any obligation to people or organizations that might try to inappropriately influence them in their work. Objectivity or neutrality. Holders of public office uh, must act and take decisions impartially, fairly and on merit using the best evidence and without discrimination or bias. Well, um, holders of public office are still humans. However, um, they, are, they, are, they ought to uh, give consideration to these principles and act uh, in accordance to them and can indeed be held accountable when they don't. Um, which takes us to the fourth st uh, standard of ethics in public life, accountability, they are accountable to the public, must submit themselves to the scrutiny necessary to ensure this. Um, one uh, example of, of uh, how this is done is that um, public office holders submit a, a statement of their wealth before they get in office and then every year uh, while in office in many, many countries. And in some countries, these statements are very public. Um, Sweden, I think, is, is famous for publicness in, in that respect. Openness. Holders of public office should take decisions openly and transparently. Information should not be withheld from the public unless there are clear and lawful reasons for doing so. Um, terrorism Act would be a uh, clear and lawful reason to not submit uh, information to the public. Honesty. Holders of public office should be truthful. And finally, leadership. They should exhibit these principles, all of those principles, in their own behavior, not necessarily uh, expected from others if they don't display it themselves. 
and they should actively promote and robustly support um, these principles and be willing to challenge poor behavior in others whenever they um, witness it. In addition to these standards of public life that are applicable to all um, public office holders, so professionals, civil servants, public servants, um, everyone that is involved in the public sector. And crucially, as you can see um, in the last sentence of the quote there, um, they also apply to all those in other sectors that deliver public services, such as, for example, doctors working for private hospitals. Perhaps that wasn't the best example, but there are, there are a lot of other examples which we will um, um, refer to next week. So on top of that, civil servants also um, need to adhere to four principles of ethics noted in civil service code, um, integrity, honesty, objectivity and impartiality. Now, these are all entailed in the seven standards of ethics in public life. Okay, but just um, there is another um, set of principles um, for them, for civil servants. Now, who are the civil servants? They are not public servants, but they are not too dissimilar from public servants. Um, civil servants are those administrators who work in uh, typically central agencies, central state agencies, such as ministries, government departments. Public servants typically work in local government or um, a public sector organizations. So uh, arguably teachers in a public school would be public servants the same way in which a local government employee is a public servant. Um, but they are not civil servants. Civil servants work in central government departments. Um, now, the main difference between public servants or civil servants and anyone else in the public sector or in public services is between them and politicians. Um, they are both governed by public ethics and the principles of public life, but they are otherwise very distinct. And if you remember our paradigms um, for public service delivery, they, are, they have made, been made distinct during the traditional public administration paradigm. That is the paradigm that really introduced the separation to ensure continuity in government, to ensure that when government changes, the infrastructure of public services does not change with every government. So um, civil servants and public servants are permanent. Now, in some countries, they're really permanent, as in there is um, almost no way to fire a public servant or a civil servant un unless it's for gross negligence or gross misconduct, which is fairly difficult to prove. Um, in other countries, however, that permanence has been challenged, so they're no longer permanent permanent, but they are definitely a lot more permanent than politicians. And the change of political regime does not um, trigger change in civil service or public service. Um, whereas politicians obviously change with, with every government. Um, where politicians are driven by ideology and compromise, so for example, a right-wing government, a right-wing politician will be very different from a left-wing politician. Um, and they would engage... Uh, in, in compromise um, uh, on a daily basis, um, civil servants and public servants, um, public servants uh, exercise neutral detachment from ideology, neutral detachment from the policies that are promoted by the government. Um, so to be insulated from political pressure. This is the reason um, for that uh, type of detachment. Um, they um, are perhaps subjected to organizational politics, like any employee in any organization, 
but not not to the the kind of politics that um, triggers public policies where public servants and civil servants are subject to bureaucratic accountability and we will talk about bureaucratic accountability later in this course politicians are subject to political accountability so um, a good way of thinking of this distinction is that politicians are accountable to voters, so everyone um, um, that everyone who votes in a country, and bureaucrat bureaucrats, so civil servants or public servants, are subject to respecting rules and regulations, um, not necessarily laws. That's different. That's criminal uh, accountability. That's not the the realm of accountability. That we're concerned with here, um, but just that uh, bureaucratic accountability refers to rules and regulations within that department. They have rational, legal, and technical input in public service design and delivery, whereas politicians drive public design, public service design and delivery based on ideology. So, for example, uh, typically a right-wing government. Um, favor privatization, right? So public services being run by at least a certain stake of the private sector, whereas a left-wing government would uh, uh, favor nationalization. So whatever is privatized, brought back into the public realm. Now, civil servants and public servants don't have a, a, a word to say about which one of the two is better. They're simply asked to implement that politically um, driven idea. And we often use the word political as a pejorative, but it's not. It's, it's really that the political compromise is really what makes public policy making possible and uh, the design of public services possible too.